Good evening and welcome to our theology class. We are picking up our study of God's great works and looking this evening at God's work of redemption and salvation. Now there is probably no other work of God that is so valuable, so important, and so central to God's purposes. This is not something that is on the periphery, a tertiary item that deserves scant attention. No, this is dead center of what the Christian faith is all about. We want to begin with just a basic orientation. When asked to tell about salvation, many evangelical Christians will typically talk about one of several things. Most will say something about the experience of asking Jesus into my heart. That's a very typical way that evangelicals express the idea of salvation. I ask Jesus into my heart. A more reformed version of this will relate that moment when I repented of my sins and believed upon Christ. And so they will give a testimony to that day and time where they experienced repentance and faith for the first time. The really super theological response, a more theologically precise statement, might be the moment when God changed my heart and I became regenerate. Now, when asked the evangelism explosion question, if you were to die tonight and stand before God, and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Most Christians will respond again along these same lines. Because I asked Jesus into my heart. Or because I repented of my sins and trusted in Christ alone for my salvation or because I'm elect, or even I'm regenerate. Now, as we think about these perspectives, what do they all share? What do they have in common? What is the common mistake of all three of these types of answers? Well, the common mistake is that they all start with and focus upon self, upon me and my experience. Whether it is a generic evangelicalism, I ask Jesus into my heart. You see, it's all about me and my experience. Or the more reformed, I repented of my sins and I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it's focusing on me and my actions. And then the theologically precise version the moment that God changed my heart and I became regenerate. It's all about me and my experience. But when we think about salvation, when we consider redemption, we have to focus first and foremost upon what God has done rather than what we have experienced. Now, I'm not saying our experiences are meaningless or insignificant, that they don't deserve some attention, but they are secondary to what God has done. The gospel is not about me and my experience. The gospel is about what God has done for me through Christ. It is about the work of God, the work of Christ, about redemption and salvation. So we want to be pointed in a Godward direction. We want to be focused on God and his work rather than obsessing on our own personal experiences. Now, as we think about redemption, we need to think about redemption as it was planned, as it was accomplished, and as it has been applied to us. Now, for this, I am very much indebted to John Murray, his excellent book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. 
And in the first half of that book, Murray is looking at redemption as it was planned by God and accomplished by Christ. And then as the third or the second half of the book carries on, it looks at how the Spirit has applied redemption to us. And so we're looking at God's planning it, Christ accomplishing it, and the Spirit's application to us. Now let's begin by looking at some passages which talk about God's eternal plan. First of all, turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, verses 11 and 12. Here the Apostle Paul writes, This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. God accomplished his great plan with the eternal purpose, which is carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. That means that God has created from eternity past a plan, a purpose. He had certain things that he determined to do, and he chose to do those in and through Jesus Christ our Lord, the one and only mediator of the covenant of grace, as we saw in our lesson on the person and work of Christ. But that word, those words, eternal purpose, those are so crucial. God didn't just do this willy-nilly and as a spontaneous action that he had never considered before he did it. No, he planned it out from all eternity. He had a purpose. Now, if you go back in Ephesians to Ephesians chapter 1, we see this uh, again spelled out by Paul, starting at verse 4 and reading on. But let me go back to verse 3 just for context, because you know how much I love context and how much I want you to love context. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Now here we have a very clear expression of God's eternal purpose. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. You see, before he made anything, before he said, let there be, and there was, before the creation existed, God had already planned, purposed, to choose out a people for himself, and he chose us in Christ. So his plan was always that in and through Christ, a people would be redeemed and saved for himself. And in his eternal plan, which he made before the world began, he had a purpose that we would be holy and blameless before him. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. So he had planned that these people whom he had chosen would be adopted as his children and would be holy and blameless before him. And all of this would come about in and through Christ Jesus. Now, in God's eternal purpose and in his sovereign plan, he not only knew about sin, but he had ordained that man would fall into sin. This is part of God's plan. Adam and Eve and their sin in the Garden of Eden 
didn't catch God by surprise. It's not as if God said, oh, wow, I didn't expect that that would happen. No, he knew it would happen because he ordained that it would happen. But he also ordained that in and through Christ, we would be saved from our sins, redeemed from the worthless life that we had chosen, and that we would be brought in and made holy and blameless. Holy and blameless through the work of Christ. So God foreordained not only that we would be saved, but how we would be saved through the work of Christ, through his suffering and death upon the cross and his resurrection from the dead on the third day. And so again, none of this caught God by surprise. None of this was unforeseen. God foresaw, he foreordained, he predestined all these things to come about. And as we are brought into the family of God, adopted as sons through Jesus Christ, it is to himself. Now, what does that mean? You might say that we have been brought into the family of God for the Father, to the Father, to relate to the Father, to have a binding covenant relationship with our great God. So God made this plan so he could save a people out for himself to be his own people. He loves us. And in his love for us, he binds us to himself, and we are his, and he is ours. And so there is a sweet bond of fellowship between God and his elect chosen people. And this is all part of his plan, that we would be his children. And as we enjoy this great plan of God in redeeming us for himself, it is to the praise of the glory of his grace so that we would be worshiping him for all eternity for his great saving work on our behalf. Well, let's turn to another passage that speaks of these things. Turn to John chapter 6, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 37 through 40. And this is Jesus speaking to the Jews. He says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So as Christ came to earth, he came to do not his own will, but to do the will of his Father, which is to accomplish his eternal plans and purposes. And as the Father sent the Son, the Son came down to draw men to himself and then to preserve them and keep them so that not one of them would be cast out or lost. And this, of course, comes about through faith in Christ, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in the Son will have eternal life. So the Son comes to save those whom the Father has given him, those whom the Father has chosen from eternity past, and the Son comes to grab them, to redeem them, to bring them to God through his work. So that those who believe on the Son, the Lord Jesus, can have eternal life and will be raised up victorious on the last day when Christ returns. So this whole work of salvation is really the outworking of God's eternal plans. 
This is what God purposed in the past, and Christ came to fulfill those plans and purposes during his life on earth. And then one more passage, Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, verses 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So God foreknew and predestined. Now there's three words which scripture uses to talk about God's eternal actions in relation to his chosen ones, his elect. One of those is foreknow. And that is not simply a knowledge about, although it does contain that. It is a knowledge and a love toward. And some have even translated this or rendered this for loved. And I think that's correct. It is a loving, affectionate knowledge. It is an intimate, caring knowledge. And so to say that God foreknew us is to say that he loved us in advance. He has loved us from eternity past. And not only has he foreknown, but he has chosen. This is the whole concept of election, a sovereign choice. And then the third word, which is used here in Romans, is predestined. And this is the idea of choosing a destination in advance. So let's say, for instance, you want to go to Kansas City, and you're looking for airline tickets for Kansas City. You don't just buy a generic ticket that will get you on an airplane going somewhere. No, you get an airline ticket that is going to Kansas City because that's your chosen destination. So you are predestining your trip to Kansas City by choosing a ticket that will get you to Kansas City. When God predestines, he is lining up the destination in advance. He is choosing in advance a destination for us to go. And when it says that he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son, it is saying this is what he was planning and purposing, that he saw the destination of being conformity to the image of his son. And he said, that's what I want my people to become. That's where I want them to go. That's what I want them to be. And so he has foreknown us, foreloved us. He has predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. He has also called us and he justifies us and he glorifies us. And so here are these purposes of God being worked out through Christ and applied by the Holy Spirit. But it's all rooted in God's eternal plan and purpose. I will choose out a people for myself because I have loved them from eternity. And I will give my son to redeem them so that they can be conformed to his glorious image. I will make them my children and I will draw them to myself. What a great privilege it is to be the objects of God's eternal love and purposes. And the fact that he has shown that to us should humble us and make us profoundly thankful for his gracious work. So we've looked at God's redemptive plan in the past. Now we want to look at the application of that plan through the finished work of Christ. So as long as we're in Romans, let's turn back to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, beginning at verse 6, 
reading through verse 11. Romans 5, 6 through 11. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now notice that there are some descriptive words to talk about us in our natural estate. While we were helpless, we were helpless. We could not help ourselves. And there was no creature that could help us. We were helpless in our sins. And then it says, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's another description of us. We were ungodly. We were not like God. In fact, we were the opposite of God. We were running away from God. And this is underlined when he says in that, this is verse 8, in that while we were yet sinners, you see, we were ungodly sinners who were breaking God's commands. That's what we were. And then again in verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Enemies. We're God's enemies, his adversaries, his opponents. We were in opposition against him. So we are helpless. We are ungodly. We are sinners. We are God's enemies. That describes us in our natural fallen condition. But while that was going on, while we were helpless, ungodly, sinful enemies of God, look at what Christ did. Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. You see, it's all about Jesus' death on our behalf, even when we were ungodly, rebellious, autonomous enemies of God who broke his law and violated his commands over and over again. We were helpless, worthless, wicked sinners. When Christ came, to die for us. Now this should forever dispel this idea that God chose us because of our potential and Christ died for us because he was so fond of us. And he saw what we would become and so he gave his life because he knew what we would be. No, he gave his life for helpless, worthless, wicked sinners who were his enemies, who were acting in rebellion against him, even as he gave up his life for us. You see, this is why it's never a reward as a result of our good works. It is always the sheer, pure grace of God, the love of God, toward unlovely people. We cannot honestly claim that we were altogether lovely. No, we were altogether unlovely. That is what we were. And then he died for us. Now, he died at the right time, at just the right time. 
And he did this according to God's own timetable. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, born to suffer and die according to God's eternal plan. And so not only does God plan who he will save and how he will save them, but he also plans when is the right time to bring the Savior into the world. And so we see God is in sovereign control of this whole process from start to finish in every aspect of our salvation. Now this saving work which Christ has done leads us to receive the reconciliation. Now we were separated and alienated from God because of our sin. In fact, the prophet Isaiah says, your sins have separated you from your God. And because of our sinful choices and the sinful choices of our first parents, Adam and Eve, a great gulf had arisen between God and us. We were alienated and he was the offended party. But because of what Christ has done, that alienation has been overcome and reconciliation has been brokered by Christ. Now that reconciliation is both ways, but it is chiefly and mainly God being reconciled to us, much more than us being reconciled to God. Now the reason I say that is because God hadn't done anything wrong to us, but we had done plenty, plenty to offend him. Now just suppose that I came up to you and without even saying a word, I just haul back and I punch you in the nose, knock you down. There's blood everywhere. And having knocked you down, having punched you in the nose, I have a caused an offense against you. I'm the offender. You are the victim of my aggression. Now, if we are to be reconciled, if we are to patch it up and make a friendship between us, who needs to apologize? Me for punching you or you for being punched by me? Oh, I'm sorry that my nose got in the way of your fist. No, no. It is the offender that is in deficit who needs to be accepted again by the one who was offended. And so when we are reconciled to God, God graciously accepts and receives us back because of what Christ has done. It's not that God has to come to us and apologize to us and say, I'm sorry for what I did. No, he didn't do anything. So when we are reconciled, it is him receiving us back into fellowship, into friendship. And through that reconciliation, we have a new situation because he has accepted us back. And so our sins are forgiven, our guilt is removed, the stain of our sin is washed away, and the alienation of our sin is overcome through his grace and mercy toward us. This is why salvation is such a wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, let's turn to another passage. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians is right after 1 Corinthians, in case you didn't know that. It's right before 3 Corinthians. Oh no, there's no 3 no third Corinthians. It's actually, there was a 3 Corinthians, but it's been lost. So anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 18. Now all these things are from God, 
who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now again, notice this language here of reconciliation. That God reconciled us to himself through Christ. So we were offenders. God had been offended. We are the aggressors. He has been the one who has been victimized by our wickedness. He, he is under no obligation to take us back. He could cast us justly and properly into the depths of hell to suffer for our evil deeds. That would be just, wouldn't it? But he has reconciled us to himself through Christ. He sent Christ to be the mediator so we could be brought back into fellowship with him so that our relationship with him would be repaired and restored and that we could again be his people and he would be our God. And so, again, the guilt of sin is taken away. Men's trespasses are not counted against them. And we are reconciled to God. Moreover, we have become the righteousness of God. Now, this is a really remarkable thing. In verse 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That is talking about how God the Father made Christ the sinless person, Christ, to be sin for us. He gave Christ all of our sins. In theology, we talk about imputation, which is the reckoning or the crediting. And so all of our sins are reckoned and credited to Christ. He takes them on. He becomes sin for us. So that we then might become the righteousness of God in and through him. And so because of this, we are now reconciled to God. And moreover, we are given the task of bringing this message of reconciliation to a lost world of dead sinners who are living in animosity against the God that they have sinned against. So we go forth as ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. See, this is what the gospel is. It's the word of reconciliation. You are out of fellowship with God because of your sin, justly so. But God is appealing to you through us, be reconciled to God through Christ. Go to Christ and find the forgiveness of your sins and the cleansing of your iniquity and be reconciled to God through Christ. Because if you put your faith in Christ, you will find that your relationship to the Father is restored. In fact, it's made better than it ever was before. Because now you are in perfect fellowship because you have the righteousness of Christ which has been imputed to you. You are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Well, one other passage, Colossians chapter 1, 
Colossians 1. And no, there's no second Colossians or third Colossians. There is a Colossians chapter 2, and chapter 1 is right before chapter 2, but I think you're probably there already. So Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So you see, this is God's great work through Christ. That through the blood of his cross, we have peace with God. The enmity that had existed because of our sin is now resolved we have peace with God. And we are reconciled and accepted by God, although we used to be alienated and hostile to him. Although we were engaged in all manner of evil deeds, the blood of the cross has taken that all away. So that we now have restored fellowship, reconciliation, and indeed, the Lord is using us as part of his great plan to reconcile all things to himself. And this was all the Father's good pleasure to do all of these things through Christ. So as we think about the finished work of Christ, we need to think about two lines and I have a diagram in the notes. If you have a copy of the notes, look there on page 31, I think it is, and you'll see the diagram. And the top line is Christ's perfect obedience. As Christ was living his life upon earth, he lived a life of perfect, personal, perpetual obedience. He kept the law in every single respect. He kept it in the letter, but he also kept it in the spirit of the law. And because of his obedience, his perfect, personal, perpetual obedience, he had earned heaven. He had kept the Father's law. He earned eternal reward as a result. But then on the lower line, the bottom line, is man in his rebellion. And as man goes along in his utter rebellion against the rule of heaven, against God, man is sinning and sinning and sinning. Everything he does is sinful. Everything is tainted by his evil, corrupt heart. And as a result, man in his rebellion is earning Nothing but hell. He doesn't even come close to earning acceptance before God in heaven. No, he is deserving of hell, the eternal punishments that await those who live in rebellion against God. But the great thing, the surprising thing, is the tremendous switch that takes place. And again, we go back to Romans chapter 5, verse 6, for the description of this great switch, this great transaction. Romans 5, verse 6, While we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. You see, what he had earned and deserved is now given to sinners. And what sinners 
had earned and deserved, namely hell, that Christ himself takes. So he gets what we deserve, and we get what he deserves. He is switching places with us. He becomes our substitute. He says, I will take the wrath and curse of God. I will take the hell you deserve, and you may have the blessing and the joy of heaven that I have earned through my perfect obedience. Can you believe it? Can you believe that such a transaction would be made on behalf of you, the guilty, vile, wicked sinner that you are? But you see, that's what Christ did. At just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let that sink into you. Consider what that actually means for you. Ungodly people ought to go to hell, right? Yeah, of course, that's where they go. But Christ took your hell and gave you his heaven so that you would never, ever go to that place where the fire never goes out and the worm never dies. That place of ongoing, uninterrupted suffering and pain. And so, man earns hell, but somehow gets heaven. And Christ earns heaven, but he endures hell on our behalf. This is the glory of the gospel of Christ. You see, this is not just about me and my experience. It's what Christ did for me. He did it on my behalf. It's his work that matters, not my experience. So we've looked at the planning, the eternal planning of redemption. We looked at the great accomplishment. Now we want to look briefly at the application. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes into view. So turn in your Bible to John chapter 3. John 3, starting at verse 3, and this is Jesus' uh, interaction with Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So this absolutely essential new birth, this being born from above, is only brought about by the work of the Holy Spirit. That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so you must be born again. In other words, you must be born of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes blowing into your life, and he applies the redemption purchased by Christ, and you are born again, born from above. And suddenly you can see the kingdom of God because you have been born again, born from God. And so the Spirit brings new life to God's elect. Until that time, they are unregenerate. They are dead in their trespasses and sins. They are ignorant 
they don't understand the things of God. They are foolishness to them. But then the Spirit comes and intervenes, and guess what? Suddenly those things make sense. Suddenly the gospel matters to them. Suddenly they have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that believe what they had never believed or understood in the past. And so as God works through the Spirit, people are born anew, born again, and have new life. One last passage, this is from Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. Verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So as the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in us, He gives life to us. He carries on spiritual life in us, and he will be the one who gives us new life at the great resurrection on the last day. So the Spirit is the life-giving Spirit who is working God's grace out in our lives. And as we experience his ongoing ministry, we bear the fruit of the Spirit. We become more and more conformed to the image of Christ We are blessed and have the likeness of God in our lives. His image is renewed and restored in us because the Holy Spirit is bringing about all of these things from within us. He dwells in the believer and he works out God's grace throughout the whole of the believer's life. Now I want to finish our lesson today by doing a short reading from the book that I referenced earlier, Redemption Accomplished and Applied by John Murray. And if you've never read this book, I would highly recommend it to you. Murray is not the easiest uh, writer to read. Sometimes his language is a bit difficult. It sometimes makes you scratch your head a little bit. But the theology that Murray conveys is so deep and rich and good and profound. So this is um, from pages 42 to 43, uh, where he talks about this whole idea of redemption. He says, the idea of redemption must not be reduced to the general notion of deliverance. The language of redemption is the language of purchase and more specifically, of ransom. And ransom is the securing of a release by the payment of a price. The evidence that establishes this concept of redemption is very copious, and no doubt need remain that the redemption secured by Christ is to be interpreted in such terms. The word of our Lord himself... Matthew 20, verse 28, Mark 10, verse 45, should place beyond all doubt three facts. One, that the work he came into the world to accomplish is a work of ransom. Two, that the giving of his life was the ransom price. And three, that this ransom was substitutionary in its nature. Ransom presupposes some kind of bondage or captivity, and redemption, therefore, implies that from which the ransom secures us. Just as sacrifice is directed to the need created by our guilt, propitiation to the need that arises from the wrath of God, and reconciliation to the need arising from our alienation from God, so redemption is directed to the bondage to which our sin has consigned us. Now, I think this is a very profound and thought-provoking thing. Sacrifice 
has to do with our guilt. Sacrifice takes away our guilt. Propitiation deals with the wrath of God and takes away God's wrath. Reconciliation resolves the problem of alienation. So what is redemption really addressing? Redemption is directed to the bondage to which our sin has consigned us. In other words, redemption is how God purchases us out of slavery to sin and sets us free to be his children. Well, again, I would strongly encourage you to read Redemption Accomplished and Applied by John Murray. I'm sure you'll be provoked and blessed by it, and you will grow as a result of reading this kind of good, solid, meaty literature. Well, that's all we have for today, and we will see you again next week.